Now we come to the next sutta. Maha Hati Pado Pama Sutta, the greater discourse on the simile of the elephant's footprint. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There, the Venerable Sariputta addressed the monks thus, Friends, monks, friends, they replied. The Venerable Sariputta said, Friends, just as the footprint of any living being that walks can be placed within an elephant's footprint, and so the elephant's footprint is declared the chief of them because of its great size, so too all wholesome dhammas can be included in the four noble truths. In what form? The noble truth of suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the way leading to the cessation of suffering. Let's stop here for a moment. Huh? So here, just like the elephant's footprint huh, is the chief, huh, because it's the biggest. Huh? Similarly, of all the dhammas, huh, the chief huh, is the four noble truths. Huh? Uh, the most important uh, is the four noble truths. Uh, as we saw in the previous sutta, the Buddha became enlightened uh, by contemplating the four noble truths. Uh. And what is the noble truth of suffering? Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair are suffering. Not to obtain what one wants is suffering. In short, the five aggregates of clinging are suffering. And what are the five aggregates of clinging? They are the material form aggregate or body yeah, aggregate yeah, affected uh, of clinging, the feeling aggregate, perception aggregate, volition aggregate, and consciousness aggregates yeah, uh, of clinging. And what is the material form or body aggregate of clinging? It is the four great elements and the material form derived from the four great elements. And what are the four great elements? They are the earth element, water element, fire element, and air element. What, friends, is the earth element? The earth element may be either internal or external. And what is the internal earth element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to, that is, head, hair, body, hair, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinew, bone, bone, marrow, kidney, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lung, bowel, entry, gorge, dung, whatever else internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to. This is called the internal earth element. Now, both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the earth element. Now there comes a time when the water element is disturbed and the external earth element vanishes. When even this external earth element, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance and change. What of this body which is clung to by craving and lasts but a while? There can be no considering that as I or mine or I am. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha says uh, that the, sometimes uh, the water element is disturbed. I guess the floods arise uh, like the story of the, uh, in the Bible of the Noah's Ark. Uh, that the whole world was flooded. Uh. Uh, so, when the whole world is flooded, uh, then the external earth element vanishes. Uh. You don't see the earth. Uh. To continue. Uh. So then, if others abuse, revile, scold, or harass a monk who has seen this element as it actually is, he understands thus, this unpleasant feeling born of ear contact has arisen in me. That is dependent, not independent. Dependent on what? Dependent on contact. Then he sees that contact is impermanent, that feeling is impermanent, that perception is impermanent, that volition is impermanent, and that consciousness is impermanent. As his, and his mind, having made an element its objective support, enters into that new objective support and acquires confidence, steadiness, and decision. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha says that uh, when a monk is scolded, uh, then he knows uh, uh, those words uh, arise because of ear contact. Uh, and similarly, uh, uh, contact is impermanent, feeling is impermanent, 
perception, volition, and consciousness are impermanent. So, this uh, sound is is part of the uh, uh, guess here has to do instead of the body. Uh, the body, the body has the uh, six senses. Uh, so the sound uh, is part of the six senses. Uh. So basically, uh, here the sutta says uh, the mind having made an element is objective support because the mind made is it. If, if, the, if the monk meditates on one of the elements uh, and then the, the mind becomes uh, one-pointed, uh, then uh, uh, it, it acquires confidence, steadiness and decision. Uh, so it won't be moved uh, easily uh, by sight, sound, smell, taste and touch and thoughts. Uh. Now if others attack that monk in ways that are unwished for, undesired and disagreeable, by contact with fists, clods, sticks or knives, he understands thus, this body of this body is of such a nature that contact with fists, clods, sticks and knives seal it. But this has been said by the Blessed One in his advice on the simile of the saw. Monks, even if bandits were to sever you savagely limb by limb with a two-handled saw, he who gave rise to a mind of hatred towards them would not be carrying out my teaching. So tireless energy shall be aroused in me, and unremitting mindfulness established. My body shall be tranquil and untroubled, my mind concentrated and unified. Now let contact with fists, cloth, sticks and knives assail this body, for this is just how the Buddha's teaching is practiced. Stop here for a moment. So here you see, yeah, the Buddha is saying uh, that a monk should practice so that the mind becomes so concentrated uh, that even if he is attacked, uh, uh, or even if he's sawn uh, um, limb, uh, uh, limb by limb uh, uh, by bandits, uh, uh, his mind will be tranquil and untroubled, concentrated and unified. So in the Buddha's teaching, uh, you can only practice this uh, with a strong mind. Without a, a mind that has attained to concentration, uh, it is impossible to practice the Buddha's teaching uh, not to be affected by words, not to be affected by fists, cloths, sticks and knives. Uh, so you see here, uh, the Buddha's teaching uh, is, 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 is to be practiced with the jhanas. Uh. When that monk thus recollects the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, if equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in him, then he arouses a sense of urgency thus, it is a loss for me, it is no gain for me, it is bad for me, it is no good for me, that when I thus recollect the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in me. Just as when a daughter-in-law sees her father-in-law, she arouses a sense of urgency to please him. So too, when that monk does recollect the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, if equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in him, then he arouses a sense of urgency. But if when he recollects the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, equanimity supported by the wholesome becomes established in him, then he is satisfied with it. At that point, monks, much has been done by that monk. I stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha says uh, that if a monk uh, recollects the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, uh, equanimity uh, supported by the wholesome uh, should become established in him. Uh. If not, uh, he should arouse a sense of urgency to cultivate it. Uh. What is this equanimity? This equanimity uh, uh, in the suttas uh, um, is uh, pure uh, in the fourth jhana. The fourth jhana. When a monk attains the fourth jhana, then the mind becomes equanimous uh, and imperturbable, uh, unshakable. Uh, uh, that is real equanimity. Uh, so, so the Buddha is saying, uh, if a monk has not attained the fourth jhana, then uh, he should have a sense of urgency to cultivate it. Uh. And what, friends, is the water element? The water element may be internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery and clung to. That is bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tear, grease, spittle, snot, all of the joint urine. Whatever else internally belonging to oneself is water, watery and clung to. That is the internal water element. 
Now both the internal water element and the external water element are simply water element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the water element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the water element. Now there comes a time when the external water element is disturbed. It carries away villages, towns, cities, districts and countries. There comes a time when the waters in the great ocean sink down a hundred leagues, two hundred leagues, three hundred leagues, four hundred, five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred. There comes a time when the waters in the great ocean stand seven palms deep, uh, six palms deep, two palms, only a palm deep. There comes a time when the waters in the great oceans stand seven fathoms deep, six fathoms, two fathoms, only a fathom deep. There comes a time when the waters in the great ocean stand half a fathom deep, only waist deep, only knee deep, only ankle deep. There comes a time when the waters in the great ocean are not enough to wet even the joint of a finger. When even this external water element, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance and change. What of this body which is clung to by craving and lasts but a while? There can be no considering that as I or mine or I am. So then, if others abuse, revile, scold and harass a monk who has seen this element as it actually is, he understands thus. Um, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. At that point, two monks, much has been done by that monk. Mm. So here the Buddha is saying uh, that there comes a time uh, when the water uh, starts to disappear. Uh, that is when the world is contracting, uh, the stars are coming closer and closer to each other. Uh, and after a long time, uh, a second sun will come into our solar system. When that happens, uh, all beings will, living beings will die, uh, the plants also will die. Uh, and then the rivers and the oceans start to become shallow and shallow. Uh, and slowly, yes third sun, fourth sun, uh, until six suns come, uh, then uh, uh, the water and the ocean also would have disappeared and the world starts to smoke. Now, when the seventh sun comes, uh, it will all burn, burn and come together uh, into a huge mass. Uh. So, the Buddha is saying uh, that um, even the external, uh, uh, this uh, water element are so, so large like the ocean uh, can even disappear. What about this body? This body uh, consists also of the same elements, uh, earth, water, fire and wind. They will, they can, they last only even much shorter time. Uh, so how can you take it to be I or mine? What friends is the fire element? The fire element may be either internal or external. What is the internal fire element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery and clung to. That is, that by which one is warmed, ages and is consumed, and that by which what is eaten, drunk, consumed and tasted, gets completely digested. And whatever, whatever else internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery and clung to. This is called the internal fire element. Now both the internal fire element and the external fire element are simply fire element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the fire element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the fire element. Now there comes a time when the external fire element, fire element is disturbed. It burns up villages, towns, cities, districts and countries. It goes out due to lack of fuel only when it comes to green grass or to a road or to a rock or to water or to a fair open space. There comes a time when they seek to make a fire even with cock's feathers and high pairings. When even this external fire element, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance and change. What of this body which is clung to by craving and last but a while? There can be no considering that as I or mine or I am. So then if others abuse, revile, scold and harass a monk who has seen this element as it actually is, he understands thus, this is not I, this is not mine, this is not myself. At that point, two monks, uh, at that point, two friends, much has been done by that monk. Uh, so here the 
uh, Rambo Sariputta is saying that this uh, external fire element, uh, sometimes it is so huge, so big uh, that it can burn uh, villages, towns, cities, districts and countries. Uh, but there's another time uh, when it disappears and, and to make a small fire also is so difficult uh, you know, to use uh, cox feathers and hide pairings. Uh, uh, so the uh, Rambo Sariputta is saying uh, that the external fire element so great also uh, uh, can disappear. One of this body, uh, this body also has the fire element uh, and it lasts only a while. Uh, so how can you take it as I or mine? Uh? But friends, it's the air element. The air element may be internal or external. What is the internal air element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is air, airy and clung to. That is, upgoing winds, downgoing winds, winds in the belly, winds in the bowels, winds that cause through the limbs, in breath and out breath, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is air, airy and clung to. This is called the internal air element. Now both the internal air element and the external air element are simply air element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the air element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the air element. Now there comes a time when the external air element is disturbed. It sweeps away villages, towns, cities, districts and countries. There comes a time in the last month of the hot season when they seek wind by means of a fan or bellows and even the strands of straw in the drip fringe of the thatch that do not stir. But when even this external air element, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance and change, what of this body which is clung to by craving and lasts but a while, there can be no considering that as I or mine or I am. So then if others abuse, revile, scold and arrest a monk who has seen this element as it actually is, he understands that uh, this is not mine, this is not I, this is not myself. At that point too, monks, uh, friends, much has been done by that monk. Uh, so here, Mabha Sariputta is saying uh, sometimes the external air element uh, is disturbed uh, and whole towns and districts and countries uh, can be swept away. Uh, you imagine the tornado in America, when they come, uh, uh, they push suck up everything to the sky. Uh. So, but there comes a, there comes a time uh, when not even the 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 thatch of the roof uh, moves, uh, and it becomes so hot. In, you need a fan. Uh. So he's saying uh, that the wind also uh, is impermanent. Uh, what of this body, uh, which has the wind element in it, uh, it lasts only a short while. Friends, this is. This is when a space is enclosed by timber and creepers, grass and clay, it comes to be termed house. So too, when a space is enclosed by bones and sinews, flesh and skin, it comes to be termed material form or body. If friends, internally the eye is intact, but no external forms comes within its range, and there is no corresponding conscious engagement, then there is no manifestation of the corresponding class of consciousness. If internally the eye is intact, and external forms come into its range, but there is no corresponding conscious engagement, then there is no manifestation of the corresponding class of consciousness. But when internally the eye is intact, and external forms come into its range, and there is a corresponding conscious engagement, then there is a manifestation of the corresponding class of consciousness. So here, uh, He's saying uh, that the form comes before our eye uh, and there is contact, uh, we pay attention, uh, then the consciousness will arise. Uh. The material form in, in what has thus come to be is included in the material form aggregate or body aggregate of clinging. The feeling, uh, perception, volition, consciousness uh, uh, is included in the uh, in the uh, five aggregates. Uh. He understands thus, this indeed is how there comes to be the inclusion, gathering and amassing of things into these five aggregates of clinging. Now this has been said by the Blessed One. One who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. One who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. And these five aggregates of clinging are dependently arisen. 
the desire, indulgence, inclination and holding based on these five, five aggregates of clinging is the origin of suffering. The removal of desire and lust, abandoning of desire and lust for these five aggregates of clinging is the cessation of suffering. At that point too, friends, much has been done by that monk. So here, uh, he's saying uh, that uh, uh, even the five aggregates uh, are dependently arisen and due to conditions they also cease. Uh. So if we let go uh, of the desire and lust for these five aggregates, uh, then there is cessation of suffering. If friends, internally the ear is intact but no external sounds comes into its range. Similarly, if the nose is intact but no external smells comes into its range, etc., then there is no manifestation of the corresponding class of consciousness. But when there is contact, then there is a corresponding arising, uh, the uh, corresponding class of consciousness arises. So he repeats that the five aggregates are dependently arisen. And the desire, indulgence, inclination, and holding based on these five aggregates, the fact of clinging is the origin of suffering. The removal of desire and lust, the abandoning of desire and lust for these five aggregates of clinging is the cessation of suffering. At that point too, friends, much has been done by that monk. That is what the Venerable, Venerable, Venerable Sariputta said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Venerable Sariputta's words. The end of the sutta. So this sutta is about the more on the four elements. So the simile of the elephant's footprint is only used in the beginning when he says that uh, the, the elephant's footprint is the chief of all footprints. Uh, similarly, the four noble truths is the chief of all dhammas. And then after that, he explains a little on the on the uh, uh, noble truth of suffering. And uh, noble truth of suffering, uh, inside there it says, uh, in short, uh, the five aggregates of attachment are suffering. Uh, and then he goes into the five aggregates. Uh, and when he goes into the five aggregates, he talks about the material form uh, consisting of the four elements. Uh, and after that, he goes into the four elements. Uh, he tries to show uh, that uh, we have the four elements inside us and outside of our body uh, is also to be found the, the four elements uh, and the four elements in the world uh, is also impermanent uh, after a long time uh, uh, you can see uh, uh, they also disappear uh, so he says uh, in this body uh, similarly uh, the four elements will also disappear uh, but uh, the time is much shorter. Uh, so since uh, the four elements in us uh, last only for, for a short time, uh, how can we take this body uh, consisting of the four elements uh, to be I and mine? Uh, but that's the end of the sutta. Stop here. Under the um, a monk is not supposed to eat too much. If we eat too much, then it's easier to become sleepy. But also, if a monk has already attained um, jhana, then as I mentioned the other night, that the five hindrances have been eliminated. Uh, so because the fire hindrances have been eliminated, uh, he doesn't become so sleepy like an ordinary person uh, with the five uh, hindrances. Uh, so you can see uh, uh, people who have not attained the jhana uh, and get rid of the five hindrances when they meditate. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, they have so much sloth and topper, uh, they are uh, half asleep. You can see that the body is going down like that. Uh, so, but if a person has already attained it, uh, uh, he, he can be tired, uh, he can be sometimes when he's very tired, uh, he cannot stop the head from some sort of falling down, but uh, he doesn't he doesn't become totally full of sloth and topper like some people. 
So if he has already attained samadhi, even after his meal, uh, he might be a, 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 have a bit of uh, what not, he might feel a bit sleepy. Uh, but once he starts to practice, uh, the mind will light up again. Uh. If a person has already attained very strong samadhi, yeah, he probably can. But then when he attains the jhana, he will fall down. His body will fall down. Yeah. Sitting is much better if you want to improve. Uh, sitting is much better. But for some people, when the sloth and topper is too strong, they find um, they cannot sit at all and they walk. Okay, shall we end here?